funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Wednesday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. A major cleanup is about to get underway at one of New Jersey's most toxic sites. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency today designated the Lower Hackensack River as the state's 115th Superfund site. It's a 19-mile stretch of river that spans Bergen and Hudson counties from the Newark Bay through the Meadowlands to the Oradell Dam. The riverbed is contaminated with cancer-causing chemicals and poisonous toxins, the result of more than a century of unregulated dumping from waterfront factories that have left a permanent mark. Well, the designation is a big step toward remediating the site in a state with the most Superfund sites in the nation. But as senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports, the cleanup could take a generation to finish. Today is truly a win for the communities along the lower Hackensack and we deserve to take a moment to celebrate. Environmental officials triumphantly added the Lower Hackensack River, 19 miles of waterway as Jersey's newest Superfund site, number 115. Making it onto EPA's Superfund National Priorities list unlocks the federal toolbox and funding required to clean up the thick gumbo of toxic sediment that's befouled the river bottom. New Jersey's industrial past helped build this country but the weight of that legacy has been unequally carried by overburdened and underserved communities. We take a crucial step toward reclaiming this vital natural resource for the communities along the Hackensack River and turning it into a clean and healthy public space for all to enjoy. I was convinced that the only way this river was ever going to get cleaned up was to unleash the almighty power of the United States Environmental Protection Agency. They know how to do this work. Riverkeeper Captain Billy Sheehan spent some 30 years lobbying, cajoling, advocating, and just plain fighting to see this day. But rehabbing the Hackensack won't be easy. For decades, no fewer than six Superfund sites along the waterway dumped or leached arsenic, lead, mercury, and cancer-causing chemicals like PCBs into the river. Landfills dotted the landscape. Particles get eaten by wildlife like crabs and fish. Signs warn folks not to eat their catch, but many ignore the advisory. This morning, these Patterson fishermen caught enough white perch to fill two buckets. They say it's really not healthy for you. No, no. Fish, fish is healthy. Fish is healthy, yeah. but, but when they have contamination from Superfund sites with chemicals, they're not that healthy. No. Nah, nah. You don't believe that? No. Nah. He said the perch would be frozen and help feed his family. Officials know their warnings go unheeded. We, we counsel them not to do it because it is dangerous, but we know that they do it anyhow. So that makes it even more urgent that we clean up these rivers. So how long will this cleanup take and how much will it cost? The short answers are decades and billions. Environmentalists expect a cleanup that dredges toxic sediment and caps contaminated river bottom. The EPA roughly estimated the Hackensack project could cost two to three billion and take perhaps 20 years. It's a massive undertaking. The Hackensack River was once thought to be among some of the most polluted water courses in our entire nation. But Congressman Josh Gottheimer says the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act passed this year infused some three and a half billion into Superfund cleanups. It also renewed another tool, the Superfund excise tax on chemical and petroleum companies that'll raise more remediation money. And government officials stand poised for legal battle with companies over liability, says Jersey's DEP commissioner. A lot of time and a lot of money gets wasted on fighting over whose mess it is, right? A lot of lawyers, a lot of consultants, a lot of time on the part of government officials wasted, right? 
for a fraction of a percent here or there. Don't waste your time or hours. Come to the table because you're going to pay. Scientists also warn that as warming oceans rise, it's crucial to clear toxins out of riverbeds that could flood and contaminate towns along the river. But cleaning up the Hackensack remains an act of political will. The former Christie administration delayed this project, and the current administration will change. Sheehan knows this. Once we get some um, momentum going, once we get the progress moving, uh, it becomes less and less of an issue as to who might get elected the next time around. It's a lot of momentum to sustain over the 20 years it'll take to get this job done. In Sea Caucus, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. You can hear more about the Hackensack River and how cleaning it up may help boost the Meadowlands' resilience to climate change. You can do that by checking out episode four of the NJ Spotlight News podcast, Hazard NJ. Listen wherever you stream your podcasts. There's been a surge in gun ownership, both here in New Jersey and across the nation, largely fueled by pandemic-related anxieties. Rutgers University did the research and found more than a million and a half New Jerseyans live in a home with a gun. Thousands are storing them unlocked, loaded in cars and in other ways that contribute to gun violence, which is the leading cause of childhood death in the U.S. Well, now it appears some New Jersey lawmakers' efforts to pass gun safe storage laws are stalled. Senior political correspondent David Cruz reports. New Jerseyans, like the rest of America, are feeling insecure, unsafe, threatened, it seems, by almost everything happening around them. Gun violence up for three years running, unrest from the left, aggression from the right, school shootings, COVID, yes, even COVID. And with the Supreme Court seemingly intent on interpreting gun rights more broadly than ever before, we are arming ourselves at record numbers. More New Jerseyans are getting firearm background checks than ever before, and one in five of us now owns a firearm. You see it in these communities. A lot of individuals are experiencing a high crime wave. So with increased crime becomes increased fear fear. They are acting out upon fear that they need to start protecting themselves because they can't rely on the government. And, says Durr, when the government does get involved, it's to control guns among law-abiding citizens, like when the governor tries to tell gun owners how to store their weapons, especially if that means unloaded and locked separately from ammunition. It makes a conservative like Durr scratch his head. What's the point of a firearm if it's unloaded and separate from the ammunition? I mean, to me, it'd be just a paperweight. So I could throw a lamp at, a per at an intruder as opposed to, wait a minute, let me go to the other room, fill my magazine, then insert it into my firearm, then, uh, then you can accost me. To me, and I don't want to just say that it's the movies or TV shows, but you know, the odds of someone coming into your home and breaking in where you need to sleep with a weapon next to you each and every night are, are just simply not logical. Truth is, in 2020, there were actually twice as many suicides as there were homicides in New Jersey. And the most common implement of choice is a firearm. That is part of the impetus for gun safety measures like the so-called safe storage bill, which Kryan says is simply common sense and backed up by a study from Rutgers that found 20% of gun owners in the state keep their guns loaded when in storage and that 15% of them don't lock them up at all. A lot of times people in the last couple of years, and before that, but particularly in these last couple of years where firearm sales have surged, have purchased firearms when they otherwise wouldn't have. Um, a lot of new firearm owners, particularly in states like New Jersey, where I think the majority of, of purchases um, during the last couple of years have been new firearm owners. And those folks aren't necessarily being trained in the risks that come with having a firearm in the home and how you can lower those risks by storing them safely. Nanny states say opponents like Republicans who put out this snarky rebuke of the bill, which Krein says he'll work to reintroduce. Democrats want to force you to store firearms and ammunition separately in their own gun safe or lockbox. If that sounds ridiculous, that's because it is. 
it's one of those passionate issues that just drives wedges in people. And frankly, I think with proper training and proper safety, as we talked about, it should actually be a unifying issue. But can the Second Amendment really be used as a unifying element? I have talked to the governor's uh, own gunpoint man, Senator Joe Cryan. He and I sit next to each other in this session when we have our sessions. And we have spoken about this. And I believe that I can bridge a gap and come up with something. And I will continue to work that way. If you come into this conversation with some humility and you're not prescribing and you have to do this exact set of things, but what might you be willing to do under certain circumstances? We have found that most firearm owners are perfectly willing to consider things. They just need to be able to consider it through their sort of set of values and personal home circumstances. It's hard to imagine that anyone could agree on anything involving firearms in these most disagreeable days. But maybe saving lives is something that's important enough for people to find a way where they can actually agree. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. Well, gun safety and ownership will undoubtedly be a major topic as the November midterm elections approach, with congressional campaigning well underway. And according to most analysts, the landscape appears to be shifting. Republicans are still favored to take control of the House, but Democrats are seeing more momentum behind their candidates, renewing hope that didn't seem possible just weeks ago. Bergen Record columnist Charlie Style this week wrote about the issues driving New Jersey voters. I recently asked him about the late summer bump that could help Democrats at the polls. Charlie, let me ask you first about whether or not you feel this is going to be a referendum on President Biden come midterm time. You write that things have shifted among Democrats. How so? Well, I, I think he's strung together some impressive victories over the summer. I also uh, legislative victories, including the Inflation Reduction Act and the dubiously named Inflation Reduction <laughs> Act. But um, and he's also um, I think it's demonstrated to the public that, yes, the Democrats or you can make the case that the Democrats can govern despite the paralysis in Washington. And I think also the uh, backlash over the Supreme Court decision that stripped the constitutional protection for abortion rights has really jolted this campaign, particularly in the more affluent suburbs. And I think uh, there are a lot of women voters from across the political spectrum who are furious. So set the stage for us. Uh, abortion, of course, being one of the issues. What else right. uh, are New Jersey voters really going to be looking at in the fall? Well, I think the economy, I think on the flip side of it, I think the inflation is a, is a big issue. I think uh, people are really concerned uh, about uh, pocketbook issues. There, uh, some of that pressure has been alleviated a little bit with the reduction in gas prices. We're still uh, looking at historic price increases and people are feeling it in their pocketbook. And the first person they blame for this is the president. It comes with the job. It comes with his, uh, not only the president, but his party. So that's going to be a very significant uh, issue. I don't think it's abated that much. I mean, this this really all just changed within the last few weeks. Uh, the president's uh, approval ratings are still pretty bad, uh, but yes. they're better than they were. So is the potential right. there then for this to completely uh, rotate again? I mean, you gave him, maybe maybe President Trump will hear this, the nickname of Bounce Back Joe. Um, <laughs> is there the potential here for this to bounce the other way? I, I think the, the potential is there to change the whole framework of this election. Going into it, Midterms are traditionally a referendum on the president and his party. But I think because of the, the spring of successes and I think uh, because of the abortion decision, I think the Democrats have a chance to make this a choice election. Do you want to uh, 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 go to a more conservative, reactionary, Republican vision of government or do you want to maintain the status quo? That's how they're going to try to frame this election. Yeah. And I think they have a, a legitimate chance at uh, doing that. 
A lot can happen, as we like to say, leading up to elections. Charlie Style with the Bergen Record. Thanks so much, Charlie. My pleasure. You can read more about which of New Jersey's house races have kicked into high gear in Colleen O'Day's reporting on njspotlightnews.org. And keep up with everything you need to know heading into the fall elections, including whether you're registered to vote and who's running in your district by clicking on the tab NJ Decides 2022. A well-intentioned law is having some unintended consequences in New Jersey. The state's new ban on single-use plastic and paper bags is instead driving up the use of those heavy, reusable sacks, piles of them, everywhere. Well, now residents are finding that what started as a way to cut down on waste is instead causing a new form of waste. Ted Goldberg reports. If you have a sizable stockpile of reusable bags, you're not alone. When we first started having to use them, I forgot them all the time. And uh, either they sat in the car or in my house, mostly the house, but I've got about probably 25, 30 of them at home. As a result of New Jersey's single use plastic ban, people like Justin Canning have gone grocery shopping without plastic bags for four months. I've been very good at putting the groceries away and immediately putting the bags right back in the car. So they're at least in the car. So I've gotten that step down. As of May, New Jersey grocery stores that are larger than 2,500 square feet can't stock plastic or paper bags anymore. Polystyrene containers like styrofoam are also against the law. And it's not just bags. Plastic straws must be requested by customers, while paper bags are okay for takeout and delivery. Foam trays are allowed for meat and fish, and thin plastic bags are fine for produce. It's hard to keep up. So without plastic bags, some shoppers are swimming in reusable bags, while others have resorted to stealing baskets from supermarkets. Unfortunately, some consumers just view it as, you know, this is something I need. Uh, I don't want to buy a reusable bag. Um, so I'm going to just take this out and, you know, kind of go from there with it. We're going to eventually probably do away with them because the cost to continue to replace these just becomes, you know, astronomically high. Each of these baskets cost $15, according to Circus Food Town owner Lou Scaduto Jr. And since the ban, he's seeing more people get groceries delivered. And each of those shipments results in more reusable bags sent to people's homes. State Senator Bob Smith sponsored the single-use plastic ban. He says something's got to give, or he needs to amend the law. If you keep on sending reusable bags every time there's a weekly delivery of food, you're going to get a pile of reusable bags, which you're not going to use and which you will throw away. And that's insane. These bags can be used for 125 times, you know, so there's um, ample opportunity for people to reuse those bags and for them um, not to have to think of them in a disposable capacity. Senator Smith says he expects an amendment to come out in September or October. Other than that, he says the law is working as intended. I'm thrilled with the results. We really want to get as much plastics out of the environment as possible because they are literally killing us. They're in the air we breathe, the water, the, the uh, some of the water that we drink, in the uh, food we eat, more importantly, fish in particular. Cindy Ziff leads the nonprofit Clean Ocean Action. She says this law will help New Jersey's waters become cleaner. That hard data will take some time to, to get, but um, you know, we're hopeful that you know, because people aren't using them as much, we'll see fewer on the beaches, and that means there's fewer out in the ocean that can harm marine life. This is a, a very, very easy thing for everybody to do, and uh, you know, I, um, if this is the, the one thing I can do to help the environment, then I'm more than happy to do it. The oceans and stuff are full, full of this plastic waste, and it's not good for the environment. That's not good, so I guess it's a good thing. Senator Smith is looking to expand the ban to try and prevent the unintended consequences of people hoarding reusable bags and stealing plastic baskets. Two things leaders did not anticipate while trying to help the planet. In Red Bank, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. Hands-on training and a guaranteed job. That's the promise for some underemployed South Jersey residents. Rhonda Schaffler has details on a new workforce program launching today, plus tonight's top business stories. Rhonda.
Brianna, Atlantic City officials today announced a new workforce development program with the promise that every graduate will receive a job opportunity. The city is teaming up with Atlantic City Electric, which will provide participants with utility training and other skills. What's being called the Atlantic City Infrastructure Program will launch this November with the first group of trainees. Mayor Marty Small called it a big win for residents. This is what a public-private partnership looks like for the good people of Atlantic City. And now that they'll have the tools to succeed, the opportunity is there. Now all they have to do is go do, do the requirements and get the career of their choice and, you know, help the next person. Housing advocates, clergy, and other leaders gathered last night in Orange in support of a bill designed to help residents reclaim their foreclosed homes. They want Governor Murphy to sign the legislation that one sponsor says puts equity into the sheriff's sale process. Foreclosed homeowners or their families would have far less stringent financial requirements to reclaim their homes, and buyers would have to commit to living in the home for at least seven years. Assemblywoman Brittany Timberlake says that would keep corporations out of communities and increase black homeownership. Homeownership is the number one wealth building tool in the country, and we have got to preserve it as much as possible. This is about equity. The state has issued a finding of probable cause that a union local violated discrimination laws by awarding certain construction jobs to white workers over black laborers. A union member filed a complaint alleging that racial slurs were also tolerated and that there was retaliation against a black member who objected to those slurs. Iron Workers Local 11 has denied the allegations. The state attorney general's office says New Jersey will receive at least $33 million as part of a multi-state settlement with e-cigarette maker Juul. The agreement comes after a two-year investigation into how the company marketed and sold its products to underage teenagers. Juul will pay a total of $438.5 million. Now here's a check on how Wall Street fared today. I'm Rhonda Schapler and those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report provided by SJ Magazine, the heart and soul of South Jersey. Online at sjmagazine.net. Well, black history was in the spotlight today as Governor Murphy signed a bill officially establishing a black heritage trail in New Jersey. The state's Division of Travel and Tourism will create a tour identifying significant locations, events, and historical markers that feature black leaders who helped propel both New Jersey and the United States in the areas of arts, education, and sciences, especially those whose roles were often overlooked. Well, the effort to create the Heritage Trail began last year with a bipartisan group of state lawmakers who argued New Jersey was long overdue in recognizing and celebrating those leaders' contributions. The bill's sponsors say it'll ensure New Jersey's black history and culture will be properly documented and appreciated for future generations. The state will maintain a website with information on the sites like the Harriet Tubman Museum in Cape May and the Hinchliffe Baseball Stadium in Newark, along with vacation itineraries based on the trail to get people to surrounding attractions and restaurants. New Jersey's black history must be told. It must be celebrated, and not just here in Newark, but all across our state. The black experience in New Jersey reaches far and wide. It encompasses every county and practically every community. It is the experience as well of countless others inventors and lawyers, educators and musicians, household names and everyday people that have enriched our state. Well, before we leave you tonight, we want to tell you about an NJ Spotlight News special. Her Story with senior correspondent Joanna Gagas. It's putting a spotlight on the many perspectives on issues affecting New Jersey's women. Tonight, a look at how the Roe versus Wade Supreme Court reversal on abortion is sitting with women in the state. 
Take a look. Throughout history, we've heard his story. Now, we hear her story. This next generation of, of young women are gonna have fewer rights than I have if we can't codify Roe v. Wade. We'll look at the recent U.S. Supreme Court decision that overturned Roe. We'll bring you a range of perspectives from women across the Garden State. I believe that abortion violates human rights. You need to find the common ground. This is her story. You can catch a rebroadcast of episode one of this new series, Primetime Tonight, at 8 p.m. on NJPBS. That's going to do it for us this evening. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us tonight. We'll see you back here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. And New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. When it comes to your health, you need someone who has your back. That's why at Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, we make sure our health plans have all the benefits you need. More ways to get care virtually. More support for your mental health, too. More tools on your phone. All in a range of health plans so you and your family can find just what you need. And we can help because everyone should feel like someone has their back. Not just in uncertain times, all the time. For more than 100 years, New Jersey Realtors have been helping their clients achieve their dreams. New Jersey Realtors live and work in cities, suburban neighborhoods, and shore communities, just like here in beautiful Asbury Park. No matter what your unique needs are, there's a New Jersey Realtor for you. Find your Realtor at nj.realestate.find.